It is good to be with you guys this morning. Um, when I was in sixth grade, my family was living in Wisconsin, um, and I was invited to be a part, there were eight of us selected, to be part of this uh, special advanced reading club, and it was supposed to be for like the top eight students, which just the fact that I was selected shows you how bad all the other students were in the school. Um, but I was selected to be a part of this. Now, uh, at that point, my family didn't have TV. We weren't allowed to watch TV or anything, so I read a lot. And so uh, I was not so interested in being in a reading club until I found out that for three hours a week, I wouldn't have to be in class. And then I was in 100%. Uh, the club was led by a friend of mine. His name was Eric, and Eric's mom was going to lead it. She's very well educated. His dad was uh, one of the leading cardiologists in all the Midwest. And I remember going over to Eric's house. Eric was like this kid that had everything. He was my buddy who had everything. And they had a movie theater in their house. And I'd never seen that because this was back in 1970. And, uh, and it was a long time ago. <laughs> and so uh, they had a movie theater. They had a sauna. We used to sit in the sauna and then run out and roll in the snow. Uh, which if you've never done that, don't. Um, it's not that much fun. Um, but I sort of idolized him. So three hours out of class, I get to hang out with my best friend. This would be really cool. Show up. And for the first couple of weeks, we actually read books and we talk about books. And then it sort of started gradually shifting in that we were doing more and more of our reading outside of our time together. And we started doing other activities in this reading club. Activities like sitting and doing meditation or yoga. Yes, this has done yoga, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it was a much different this, but it has done it. Check that off the bucket list, never to return. We would do uh, things like, I, I remember one day uh, with, there was incense, and it was, uh, can you imagine what your spirit animal is? Now, for a young boy who's been raised in the extreme conservative Pentecostal church, all the hairs on my neck are standing up. And then she used the word new age. And I was like, oh, my parents are going to kill me if I don't get out of this. But uh, I need to, to make a change um, for sure. And it was this, this whole new age kind of thinking, this mind over matter, this power of positive thinking, this, you know, envision your reality. If you can see it, you can be it kind of things. And sometimes uh, it even can sound biblical right? I mean, Scripture tells us where there is no vision, the people perish. So Scripture talks about this idea of having vision as connected to life as well. It says uh, things like, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So there's a power of our thinking. It says that we are to, you know, whatever is good, whatever is pure, whatever is just, that we're to think on these things. But there's a massive difference between the kind of mind over matter that we're talking about today and what the world talks about. There's a massive difference between the new age kind of self-help and the biblical concept of mind over matter. And here's one of the things that you can look at to see the big difference. In the world's view, you have mind over matter by, you know, getting power from within yourself. You get the power from within yourself, and the benefit is all for you. When we talk biblically having mind over matter, the power is not from ourself. The power is from God, from Christ, from being fully in him, and it has nothing to do with the self. It has to do with how we live life for everyone else. Now, last week, Pastor Chris uh, talked about um, being an optimist and a pessimist and things of that nature. He said, you know, you might say for an optimist that life is full of, anybody remember? Opportunities. Way to go, Hannah. Good job. He might say that you're a pessimist and then life is full of disappointment. Or you're a realist and then life is full of choices. Well, I, I want to go a little bit further uh, with that idea. How many of you have ever heard the saying, the optimist looks at the glass as half full, and the pessimist looks at the glass as half empty. Right? Um, I just think that's incorrect. 
I think both the pessimist and the optimist look at the glass and know exactly how much water is in there. But it's a matter of their perspective from there. The, the person who is an optimist sees this and says, well, at one point this was empty, and it's obviously got more in it now than it used to have, and there's so much more room for it to fill up even more. The, the pessimist looks at it and goes, well, obviously at one point this was full, and it's losing water, and it really can't afford to lose that much more, and obviously the water is going down. Anybody know people like that? No pointing. <laughs> what God has called us to is a view of looking at reality, wherever your cup is, whatever level it's at, and having the mind of Christ to understand that he is taking care of the direction of it and that he has greater things in store than you could ever imagine. So this morning, we are going to look at Philippians chapter 2. If you have your Bibles and you want to flip over there, follow along on the app, or you can follow along on the screens behind me. Philippians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Now, here's how I read that passage for years until just a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago, I read this passage differently for the first time in my life. Our life group was walking through this, and something jumped out at me. And it, it's amazing. I don't know how it took this long. Here's how I had read that passage forever. Therefore, if you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if comfort for his love, if common sharing in the spirit, if tenderness and compassion, you notice something missing? The word any. If you have your pencils with you or pen, I encourage you to just underline that every time you see that word in that passage in your Bible or on your notes. The Apostle Paul doesn't say if you have the fullness of these things that you should be changed. He said if you have any of these things, you should be changed. That a little bit changes everything. Now, my kids love this stuff. Mio, anybody else? Mio? They say it makes water taste better. I say corn syrup and carbonation does a better job. But they use this all the time in their water, and you're supposed to put just a few drops, not a whole bottle like I do, but it doesn't take much, just, just any, just a little bit. That water will never be the same. That water's forever changed. I, I can't go back in there and separate this back out. It, it's forever different. If you have any of Christ in you, you are forever different. Nothing is the same. And the enemy wants you to believe if you're not feeling the fullness of everything, then you need to succumb to the ways of the world. But the Apostle Paul says if you have any, if you have any, then you can have faith and hope that God has the rest under control. That God has the rest in his plan. And you can rest in the fact that he cares for you more than you can even imagine. Scripture says that you're the apple of his eye. That he knows the very hairs on your head. That you are his masterpiece. If you believe that he is thinking of you in that way and you have any of him, then you can trust him with all the other details. And he says, if you realize that, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit, and of one mind. What mind are we talking about here? We're talking about having the mind of Christ. Now look around the room, and you're supposed to be in one spirit and one mind with everyone you just looked at. Some of y'all didn't get past your spouse. 
That's okay. Come talk to me afterwards. We'll work on that. You're to be in one mind and one spirit because we have any of Christ. We should be focused on what we share, what we have in common, not at all the little things that we let divide us. But then he goes further because now he's going to look at the example of Christ. He's going to say, if you have any, now you've got to go to nothing. Look in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking on your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing, By taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. If you have any of Christ, then Christ's example then becomes that we become nothing. All throughout scripture you find this phrase, humble yourself. Now, I just want to point this out, that humbling yourself is an assignment given to us. It doesn't say pray to be humble. It says humble yourself. Why why is it like that? Well, one theologian has said, why would you pray for the God of all the universe to humble you? I I want you to think about it. When you ask the God who created everything and is all-powerful and all-knowing and holds everything in his hands to humble you, that might not go the way you want it to go. And I can tell you that because I've been that person. 30 years old, driving down a freeway, heard a song by a buddy of mine, had me pulled over on the side of the road weeping, saying, God, I will, I'll give everything for you. God, just humble me. And man, did God answer. He crushed me. Now, I'm thankful that he did because I'm thankful that I'm not the person I was. But if I could go back and do it all over again, I'd say, God, uh, I'm going to work on this myself for a little while. Humble yourself. He says the, the, the one mind that we're to have is based on selflessness. It, it says that we're to look not to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. Now I want you to know something. It doesn't say not looking only to your own interest. It doesn't say not looking all the time to your own interest. It says, imperatively, don't worry about your own interests. Think about others. Be selfless. It rings true of what Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 and 35, when he says, a new command I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples. By the way they see you, love one another. He says there's this new way of doing things, this this love that's being poured out. We see the example of Jesus here being poured out, being broken, becoming nothing. You see, humility, submission, selflessness, these are an attitude that are made up from our choice and our learning to be those things are learning to submit. During that time of God humbling me, I learned that I had never had a mentor in my life. I had never had men pour into my life. And in the midst of everything going crazy, uh, I found myself sitting at a, uh, a little coffee shop and a meeting had been arranged between myself and the CEO of Star of Hope in Houston, at that time the largest uh, ministry and homeless shelter in America. And I was meeting with their CEO, and we'd never met before. Somebody had arranged this meeting. And about two minutes into the meeting, this guy looks at me, and he goes, you're the most arrogant I've ever met in my life. 
To which I said, no, I'm not, and started arguing. And then he put his hand up and he goes, hold on. You don't understand what arrogance and humility is. He goes, being arrogant simply means being unteachable. And being humble means being willing to admit that you don't have all the answers and you don't know it all. Now imagine how our lives would change if in our relationships with one another we lived listening because maybe there's something we have to learn. Maybe there's something we have to learn from someone else. Maybe there's something, uh, and it may not be some huge factual shift in life, but if nothing else, we can learn something about them and their life and their perspective. When we walk in humility and we walk in selflessness and we walk in submission, submission is that word that in America we're not supposed to use. I mean, seriously, I know pastors that will not use the Ephesians passage when they do weddings. Because it says, wives, submit to your husbands. And everybody's in an uproar over that. You know what the next part says? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Um, Christ died. <laughs> so men, if you think she's supposed to submit, then you go die. <laughs> and women, if you think the submit part is so bad, he's supposed to go die. We are to live in submission to one another, trying to outdo each other in how we honor and how we love. Having any leads to being nothing. So let me be painfully clear. If you are not submitting, if you're not walking in humility, if you are not a servant of others, then either you do not have the mind of Christ or you're choosing not to live from the mind of Christ. There are no other options. If those attributes aren't your attributes, then the mind of Christ is not in you. That's why we have such a sin battle if you go and you interview people who are under the age of 40, by far and away the number one thing they say about the church in America is that we are judgmental. They were quick to point out sin. Andy Stanley in his new book, Irresistible, says that we shouldn't be spending our time asking, is blank sin? We should be asking the question, what does love require of me? Why? Is blank sin causes me not to want to serve someone if I believe they're in sin. It may cause me not to want to be around them, not to want to be in fellowship with them. Because the truth is, for all of our religious piety, for most of us, when we start trying to avoid sin with the wrong intentions, we also start avoiding sinners. But when you're asking the question, what does love require of me, the outcome is totally different. It's this kind of love that Christ spoke about. I mean, for us, most of us, avoiding sin is normally this white-knuckled, self-disciplined act of, of changing who I am or changing a part of me. And it's making sure that I'm not hitting the wrong target, whatever your target is. Maybe your target is lying. Maybe it's cheating. Maybe it's pornography. And so for most of us, we live our Christian lives trying to have sin avoidance. If I can just not hit that sin. Sin literally means to miss the mark. Most of us spend our Christian lives trying not to hit the wrong mark, but never readjusting our aim to hit the right mark. If I'm hitting the right mark, guess what I'm not hitting? The wrong mark. What's the right mark? Christ, the mind of Christ, to know him, to glorify him, to be in relationship with him. And that changes everything 
when I shift my life toward that, and I shift my life toward asking the question, what does love require of me? And then, verse 9. So we've just come through the fact that Jesus became nothing, suffered this horrible death on the cross. It says, therefore God exalted him to the highest place, and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He became nothing, but because he became nothing, the Father said, now I'm going to give you everything. He became poured out, and God said, now I'm going to make you lift it up. In fact, Paul talks about that poured out part next. Verse 14, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Some of y'all might want to underline that. In your Bible, not your spouse's Bible. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault and a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like the stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming for your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. Paul says, as I become nothing, as I'm poured out, what's being filled up in him? Joy, rejoicing. Purpose, meaning. Some of you are chasing after meaning and purpose in life with everything you have. Quit chasing it. Start being poured out. Paul is talking here in symbolism of, in the Old Testament, the drink offering. When the best of the wine would be just poured, seemingly meaningless, it would just be, just be poured. Poured over the altar. The best that you have being poured out sacrificially over the sacrifice. And as you are emptied, the trust implied there is that God is sufficient to fill it right back up. That that's not what you needed in the first place. And that when you become nothing, then he is going to take you to the place of having everything truly means trusting that God will fill you up. In case you haven't figured it out, this world is not fair. This world is not easy. This world is rough and tough. But God is bigger than this world. Tap into him. Let him take care of all the details. But you can't have it both ways. You can't have control and surrender. You can't have your will and his blessing. We, we see this from Jesus the night that he's crucified. Goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, goes alone by himself to pray. And he's so stressed out because he knows what's about to happen. He knows what's coming. As he's praying, he's so stressed that the, the capillaries in his head are breaking and, and he's literally sweating drops of blood. And he cries out to the Father, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any other way to, to reach your people, if there's any other way to have a sacrifice that gives grace instead of law, if there's any other way to restore things the way you intended them at creation, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Some of you have done a good job of the first part of letting God know what you want. But getting to that next place of submission and surrender, of saying, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 
that's a place you haven't taken a step, let me encourage you this morning. Take that step. Some of you are here this morning and you may not even know why you're here. You may not know why you're here and you may not know why you're here, like in the world. You're looking for meaning and purpose, for joy and hope and life. I just want to say to you, if you find yourself in that place, the only place you will find everything is by giving up everything and accepting the price that Christ has paid for you to cover up all of your wrongs, all of your mistakes, all of the mess that you've made. The cross of Christ is the place where you can come and lay every single part of it down. And you can walk away a brand new creature simply by believing and putting faith in the fact that he became nothing. Submitted to even death on a cross to pay the price so that you might be in relationship with the Father. If you're here this morning and you don't know what it means to have a relationship with Christ, to exchange your old life for a new life, we would love to pray with you and to talk with you. Here in a few minutes, our prayer team will be down underneath the crosses, and I encourage you, take the two or three or four minutes to, to come and have a conversation that can radically change your life, both here and for all of eternity. But maybe you're here this morning and and you've forgotten the any part, right? You know you got a little bit of Jesus, but you're looking at a whole lot of world. And what you're letting drive your joy and your peace and your contentment isn't the little bit of Jesus, it's the whole lot of world. Well, this morning what you need to do is you need to come and leave that at the cross as well. You need to come and you need to claim to the any that if you have any of him, you are made new, you are new, you are whole. Some of you may just need to embrace this new mindset of living a life in submission and humility. So here in a few minutes, we're going to share together, I don't know how you can talk about Christ becoming nothing and not participate in the Lord's Supper together. But I'm going to ask you before we do that in this time, while we have some music and the elements are passed here in a moment, just to spend some time in prayer. What is it in your life that you're holding on to? What is it that you haven't surrendered to his control? What is it that you haven't submitted? Maybe it's a person that you haven't surrendered to or submitted to. And you're choosing right now to be right. And you are right. But you're choosing to be right over choosing to be righteous. And they're not the same thing. And the question you need to be asking is, what does love require of me? Scripture says before we come to this table to examine our hearts. So as Connor plays here and as the elements are passed, I'm going to ask you just to do that. The elements are passed. You'll find there's two cups staffed, one with a wafer, one with juice. I ask you just to hold on to those for a few minutes. And after everyone has theirs, we'll share together this morning in the taking of the Lord's Supper. So Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, celebrating Passover. Jewish tradition, Passover is a celebration that when the 10th plague of Egypt happened, that led to the children of Israel finally being set free. That plague was the death of the firstborn of everyone in the country except for those followed very specific instructions to sacrifice a perfect lamb and to take the blood and to paint it on the doorpost. So when the angel of death passed through the land, it would see the blood and it would pass over those homes that the Jewish people had done that. And every year they would celebrate this. The men Jesus is hanging out with his disciples. A lot of people think Peter is probably the oldest at around 20. 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. 
By the age of 12, all of them can quote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They celebrated Passover their whole lives. They're very familiar with the liturgy. Sometimes I think we forget their perspective of that night sitting there. Because while they're sitting there, Jesus begins to say some things that they had to realize were radically different than any celebration they'd ever experienced before. The bread in his hands, he blesses it. And he takes and he breaks the bread. And then he says to his disciples, this is my body. Not some other sacrifice, my body. Broken for you. As often as you take of this, do so in remembrance of me. The body of Christ broken just for you. And in like manner as the meal went on, the cup came around and Jesus blessed the cup, and then he said something really radical. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant. They've been raised their whole life under this old law, this old covenant, this old promise, this old way of living by works. Now Jesus says there's a new promise, there's a new covenant. This is the cup of the new covenant. This is my blood shed for the remission of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. The blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so, Father, this morning, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for a new covenant. We thank you that you paid the price so that we might have life everlasting life, uncommon life, abundant life, life with meaning and hope and purpose. We might have relationship with you. We thank you for the cross. And Father, this morning as we prepare to go from here, we ask that you would help us to humble ourselves. Don't do it for us. Give us a shot. Father, help us to learn to walk in humility and submission, to honor one another, to be reminded that if we have any of you, that we have enough, and that as we pour ourselves out, we find that you give us all that we could ever dream of. In the name of Christ, we pray.